Oh, jeez. You have seen it that many times, haven't you? Don't you even know how to be a real Indian? Native American actors have been active in Hollywood since the silent film era. They might not have gotten much accolades, but they are sure getting it now. Here are 10 of the best Native American actors in Hollywood history. I know you people. I know what kind of slanted-eyed savage you are, boy. Number 10, Adam Beach. It goes without saying that Adam Beach is a prominent figure in Hollywood. He is widely recognized as one of the most esteemed Native American actors right now. You might recognize him from his notable portrayals of Victor Joseph in Smoke Signals, Ira Hayes in Clint Eastwood's Flags of Our Fathers, Dr. Charles Eastman in Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, or as Detective Chester Lake alongside Ice-T in Law & Order Special Victims Unit. He even had a brief stint as DC's Slipknot in the 2016 film Suicide Squad. Sadly, his venture into comic book roles was short-lived due to his character's swift demise. But you already get the idea. He is a recognizable face in Hollywood. So far, his career boasts over 60 feature films and nearly 50 television titles and series episodes. So there is no doubt that Beach has left an indelible mark on the entertainment industry. So let's delve into his background, shall we? Adam Beach was born on November 11, 1972, in Ashburn, Manitoba. He was raised on the Dog Creek First Nations Reserve with his two brothers. His parents were Sally and Dennis Beach. Notably, Beach is of Salto Anishabi descent. Now, this is a branch of the Ojibwe nations within Canada. The Salto derived their name from the French term meaning people of the rapids. They were traditionally hunters and fishers who had maintained extensive trading relationships with French, British, and later American settlers. You could say that this is a reflection of their historical location around Sault Ste. Marie. Historically, the Salto inhabited regions around Lake Superior and Lake Winnipeg, including present-day Salt St. Marie and northern Michigan. It was pressure from European settlers that gradually pushed them westward to Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and a community in British Columbia. Forced to relocate to less fertile lands, they managed to retain much of their assigned territory and reserves, escaping European-Canadian competition for their lands. Today, most Salto reside in the Interlake District, Swan River, Duck Bay, Camperville, Southern Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, particularly around Kamsak. So, how does a boy from Salt St. Marie make it into Hollywood? For starters, he did not have it easy as a child. Tragedy first struck when his mother was killed by a drunk driver. This was then followed by the drowning of his alcoholic father weeks later. Beach and his two brothers were taken in by their grandmother and later by their uncle and aunt in Winnipeg. It was there that Adam found solace in drama classes and started acting in local theater productions. Since then, he has made a name for himself as a Native American actor. His portrayal of Ira Hayes in the Academy Award-nominated film Flags of Our Fathers was so outstanding that it earned him two nominations for Best Supporting Actor, and that was not the only time he stood out in a cast. He has also received three nominations for his performance in Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee in 2007. He even received a nod from the Golden Globes. To crown it all up, word in the street is that he hopes to one day become an appointed leader of his Lake Manitoba First Nation. Makes my heart sad. A world without human beings has no center to it. Number 9. Chief Dan George Chief Dan George made history as the first Native American actor to be nominated for an Academy Award. But of course, this is not the most interesting thing about him or his ancestry. He gained international fame for his portrayal of old lodge skins in Little Big Man. He was 71 years old at the time, and he earned both an Academy Award nomination and a Golden Globe nomination for his outstanding performance in the film. Interestingly, he continued his career well into his later years, and George appeared on various television shows such as Bonanza, Kung Fu, and The Incredible Hulk. In recognition of his contributions to cinema, the Canadian postal system honored Chief Dan George with a postage stamp in 2008. This was part of the Canadians in Hollywood stamp series. One thing about Chief Dan, he was always praised for his natural dignity and warmth. Both audiences and critics alike will attest that he always left a lasting impression in his films. Born Geswanu Salhut, Chief Dan George was a respected leader of the Swalwatooth Nation. Now, this is a Coast Salish band whose Indian reserve lies on Barood Inlet in the southeastern part of the district of North Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Previously identified as the Burrard Indian Band, the Tslil'wa'tooth Nation comprises the Coast Salish people. The Coast Salish speak a certain downriver dialect, 
of the Halkomelen language. They are closely related to neighboring nations like the Squamish and Mesquim. One difference, though, is that they maintain distinct political and cultural identities. Speaking of culture, let us dive a little deeper. Again, the Coast Salish constitute a collection of ethnically and linguistically connected indigenous communities. These communities were along the Pacific Northwest Coast, residing in British Columbia, Canada, and the U.S. states of Washington and Oregon. But what's really interesting about this group is that it encompasses diverse cultures and languages within its numerous nations. Unlike many North American hunter-gatherer societies, the Coast Salish Society was characterized by complexity and hierarchy. You know, like all the consuming focus on property and social status? And in a society like this, slavery seemed inevitable. Slaves were regarded as property rather than members of the tribe. And sadly, their children inherited their slave status. Well, it is certain that slavery existed within the Coast Salish communities. The extent of its practice, however, remains subject to debate. The Coast Salish are not the only Native American society out there that dabbled in the slave trade. So you don't want to miss the communities we'll touch on next. Moving on, their diet primarily consisted of salmon, supplemented by a diverse range of other seafood and foraged foods. Now, this is in part due to the milder climate of the South Coast Salish. Did you know that the artistic traditions of the Coast Salish have been reinterpreted and incorporated into contemporary art? Especially in British Columbia and the Puget Sound region, talk about a lasting impact. A quick dive into their religious beliefs will reveal some more interesting facts about the Coast Salish people. You see, they had beliefs in guardian spirits and the ability to shift or transform between human and animal forms. They also had complex and fluid concepts of the soul, the afterlife, and visionary journeys through altered states of consciousness. Interestingly, the Coast Salish communities expressed their spiritual powers through dances, masks, and ceremonies, all of which are believed to reflect their given spirit powers such as leadership, bravery, healing, and artistry. So do you think Chief Dan George stayed true to his roots? Do you think he partook in spirit dancing ceremonies? Sure would be nice to know. Chief Dan George continued to pursue acting until he passed away in 1981 at the age of 82. He reportedly died on the same Indian Reserve in North Vancouver where he was born. Coming up next is an actor from the silent film era who juggled being a chief on and off the screen. Number 8. Elijah Tahamon Also known as Dark Cloud, Elijah Tahamon was a prominent and revered First Nation silent film actor. Born on September 20, 1855, Tahamont initially gained recognition as a favored model for artist Frederick Remington. This was a prominent Western illustrator of the late 19th century and early 20th centuries. Remington even penned and illustrated a novel titled John Ermine of Yellowstone, a novel that was said to be inspired by Tahamont's image. By 1910, Tahamont ventured into the film industry. Adopting the name Dark Cloud, he would join American Mutoscope and Biography in New York City. He made his screen debut during the era of Eastern Westerns and also collaborated with renowned director D.W. Griffith and cinematographer Billy Bitzer. Other notable film roles included appearances in What Am I Bid, The Woman Untamed, The Birth of a Nation, and The Dishonored Metal. In contrast to later Westerns portraying Native Americans as dramatic and prone to conflicts, the early films Tahamont was a part of portrayed Native Americans as passive. You could say the early films also depicted them with dignity as they placed them in serene, almost motionless profiles. These calm and expansive landscapes kind of reflected the lives of Native Americans. All through the 1910s, Dark Cloud appeared in numerous westerns and other films. At some point, he relocated to Griffith's company in the West Coast in 1912. Sadly, he had a brief film career of only eight years as his life was tragically cut short by the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. But before his passing, he managed to feature in at least 34 silent movies. And in that time, he gained recognition as Chief Dark Cloud or William Dark Cloud. One thing to note is that Dark Cloud was of Abenaki descent. These are a group native to Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and Southern Canada. They are a First Nations band government representing the Eastern Algonquian peoples of Northeastern North America. The Abenaki are indigenous inhabitants of the Northeastern woodlands of Canada and the United States. They belong to the Algonquian linguistic group and are a part of the broader Wabanaki Confederacy. The Eastern Abenaki dialect predominated in Maine, while the Western Abenaki dialect was spoken in Quebec, Vermont, and New Hampshire. 
The name Abenaki exists in various forms, including Abenaque, Abakivas, Wabanakianek, and Wabanakis, among others. According to accounts in the Jesuit relations, the Abenaki were characterized as non-cannibalistic. They exhibited docile behavior, ingenuity, moderation in alcohol consumption, and the absence of profanity. Abenaki society mirrored that of other Algonquian-speaking peoples in southern New England. They engaged in agriculture, establishing villages near fertile river floodplains, while also hunting, fishing, and gathering wild plants and fungi to support their diet. The Abenaki practiced a farming lifestyle, with men primarily undertaking hunting activities while women managed the fields and cultivated crops. Before his passing, Tahamont served as a chief among the Abenaki. Interestingly, Tahamont was often dressed as Hollywood's interpretation of a Plains Indian chief for his theatrical roles. Now, despite being a chief himself, it's worth noting that he did not wear those ceremonial attires he wore in movies, in his personal life. This just goes to show Hollywood's tendency to stereotype and homogenize the cultural diversity of native tribes across the Americas. Are you even shocked at that? Now, let's see how this star went from suppression in boarding school to advocating for Native American rights. Number 7. Floyd Red Crow Westerman Floyd Westerman is yet another notable Native American musician, activist, and author. Initially known for his country music, he later transitioned to acting. As an actor, he often portrayed Native American elders in American media under the name Floyd Red Crow Westerman. Westerman was born on August 17, 1936, on the Lake Traverse Indian Reservation. This area belongs to the federally recognized Sisseton Wapaton Oyate tribe. Westerman experienced cultural suppression at Wapaton Boarding School, but it wasn't all grim news because this was where he encountered Dennis Banks, a future leader of the American Indian movement. This period of enforced assimilation deeply affected Westerman in a way. This was most likely the determining factor that made him embrace and promote indigenous cultural preservation in his later years. After earning a BA in secondary education from Northern State University, he went on to serve in the U.S. Marine Corps. From this point, Westerman began his journey to fame by pursuing a career in music. Yes, before this renowned actor ventured into film and television, he first gained recognition as a country western musician. Through his songwriting, he delved into and scrutinized the European influences on Native American societies. Alongside his solo work, Westerman collaborated with notable artists like Jackson Brown, Willie Nelson, Bonnie Raitt, and others. In the 1990s, he joined Sting on a tour aimed at fundraising for rainforest preservation. He had a good run as an artist, but would in time transition from music to acting. Westerman made his cinematic debut in the 1989 film Renegades. His filmography then expanded to include such roles as Chief Ten Bears in Dances with Wolves and The Shaman in Oliver Stone's The Doors. On television, he took on various roles, including Uncle Ray in Walker, Texas Ranger and George in Dharma and Greg. Now let's back up a bit. Remember his cinematic debut? In the Renegade film, he portrayed Red Crow, the Lakota Sioux Patriarch. This is pretty interesting because Westerman was of Dakota Sioux descent. The Sioux Indians were a nomadic and family-oriented people. As nomads, they roamed around the Great Plains with their dogs, hauling their belongings. In this society, women took up essential roles like cloth-making, hide-processing, and wood-gathering. No doubt proud of his heritage, Westerman became a renowned advocate that actively spoke and marched for Native American rights. Number 6. Will Sampson, Jr. Born September 27, 1933, William Sampson, Jr. was renowned for his talents as a painter, actor, and rodeo performer. He is remembered for his portrayal of Chief Bromden. He brought this seemingly deaf and mute character to life in the 1975 classic One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Another recognizable role was the portrayal of Crazy Horse in the 1977 western The White Buffalo. For nearly two decades, Sampson actively participated in rodeos. He specialized in bronco busting and made quite the name for himself. It was during this time on the rodeo circuit that producers Saul Zanes and Michael Douglas came into contact with him. Both producers had been casting for their next project titled One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. They were looking out for a tall Native American actor for the role of Chief Bromden. You can already guess where this is headed, right? Sampson stood at 6 feet 7 inches tall, so it was definitely meant to happen. 
First, Samson's name was suggested to them by rodeo announcer Mel Lambert. Then, despite his lack of acting experience, he was selected for the role after what seemed like an endless search. As you can imagine, Samson's notable performances extended beyond One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He went on to exceptionally portray roles like Taylor the Medicine Man in the horror film Poltergeist 2, as well as the recurring character Harlan Tooleaf on the television series Vegas. You would also spot the actor in movies like Fishhawk and Orca. Needless to say, Samson had a prestigious acting career. We can't forget to mention that he participated in the American Indian Theatre Company's production of Black Elk Speaks in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He worked on this prestigious project alongside notable actors like David Carradine, Wes Studi, and Randolph Mantooth. Additionally, he portrayed Crazy Horse alongside Charles Bronson in The White Buffalo. Now, not much is known about his personal life, but one thing seems to be certain. Samson was a proud member of the Muscogee Nation. Samson was deeply rooted in his cultural heritage. The actor lived in Okmulgee County, Oklahoma, and identified as a member of the Muscogee Nation. This is a tribe that had its origin traced to the southeastern woodlands. The Muscogee Nation holds federal recognition as a Native American tribe located in Oklahoma. Among its official languages are Muscogee, Uchi, Natchez, Alabama, and Kosati. Notably, Muscogee is the most widely spoken of these languages. As you can imagine, the tribe's population comprises Muscogee individuals and their descendants but it also includes those of African descent who were enslaved and forcibly relocated from their ancestral lands. These African descents then moved to the Indian Territory during the Trail of Tears in the 1830s. So will it be. I reckon so. Up next is an actor who has furthered the lives of his people and culture in more ways than one. Number 5. Luther Standing Bear if you thought that was a unique name, just wait till you hear that Luther Standing Bear was also known as Otakate or Plenty Kill. Born in December 1868, he would grow up to become a distinguished author, educator, philosopher, and of course, actor. His journey began in 1912 when he was relocated to California. There he was enlisted as a consultant by film director Thomas H. Ince. He leveraged his experience as a performer with Buffalo Bill's Wild West, and made his cinematic debut in the 1916 film Ramona. For someone who stumbled into acting, he did it for quite some time. Notably, he remained active in the motion picture industry until the 1930s. During that time, he collaborated with renowned figures like Tom Mix, Douglas Fairbanks, and William S. Hart. Standing Bear contributed to early Hollywood westerns by portraying both indigenous and non-indigenous characters. His extensive filmography includes titles like White Oak in 1921, Cyclone of the Saddle in 1935, and Union Pacific in 1939. However, acting is not the only thing Standing Bear is remembered for. Raised in the rich oral traditions of Lakota culture and educated in white society, Luther Standing Bear uniquely bridged both worlds. He authored historical accounts in English and made sure to detail his people's experiences. He referenced his early life on reservations and the years at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in his works. These writings have since provided a Native American perspective during the Progressive Era in American history. Standing Bear's insightful commentaries on Native American culture still serves as a means to enlighten the American public. It also serves as a medium to foster a deeper understanding and garner popular support for policy reforms that will benefit Native American peoples. So if you ever wondered who shaped the 20th century perception of Native American culture as holistic and reverent toward nature, now you know who to thank for that. We mean, isn't it outstanding that his insightful writings still have a place on college-level reading lists? Various disciplines like anthropology, literature, history, and philosophy have since placed great value on his works as they constitute a valuable legacy and repository of Native American wisdom. Notably, he is a prominent Sikangu and Oglala Lakota figure. In his lifetime, Luther was dedicated to preserving his Lakota culture and sovereignty. It is said that he never missed an opportunity to advocate for progressive changes in government policies toward Native Americans. The Oglala are among the seven sub-tribes of the Lakota people. Many Oglala individuals reside on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Now this stands as the eighth largest Native American reservation in the United States. The Oglala are officially recognized as the Oglala Lakota Nation, and alternatively referred to as Oglala Lakota Ayate. In Oglala Lakota society, men typically held leadership roles in tribal politics. While some served as chiefs responsible for political matters and leaders in times of war, others were warriors and hunters. 
However, women played an even more pivotal role in family and tribal life among the Oglala. They were responsible for crafting essential items used by their families and tribes. They also cultivated crops, prepared food, processed game and fish, and even crafted clothing and footwear. To top it all off, women traditionally held authority over food, resources, and movable property. That said, they were essentially the owners of the family homes. Upon marriage, men were traditionally expected to join their wife's family and reside with them. Next is a versatile actor who is currently inspiring the next generation of Native American actors. He came along and wanted to see the real West, so I said, okay, he pays well. We get all dressed up in war paint and go woo. Number four, Graham Greene. This 71-year-old Native American actor has a remarkable life and career so far. We mean it has been nothing short of notable achievements in film and television. Born on June 22, 1952, in Oshwegan, Ontario, Canada, Green is definitely one Native American actor who had to make this list. Throughout his career, Green has portrayed a diverse range of characters across various genres. Whether playing historical figures like in the film The Green Mile, or contemporary characters in television series such as Northern Exposure and The Red Green Show, he has been praised for his ability to bring depth and authenticity to his roles. Want to know the best part of all this? Green seemingly has a commitment to representing indigenous people accurately and respectfully in film and television. He has been an outspoken advocate for indigenous rights and issues. He continues to use his platform to raise awareness and promote a positive representation of Native American cultures in the media. In addition to his acting career, Green is also involved in community activism and cultural preservation efforts within indigenous communities. He started off his acting journey in the theater. He started at the Native Earth Performing Arts Center in Toronto. By 1984, he had landed a role in the CBC series Spirit Bay. However, it was his portrayal of Kicking Bird in Kevin Costner's Dances with Wolves in the year 1990 that catapulted his career. This portrayal earned him an Academy Award nomination. Thankfully, he kept the momentum going. Following the breakthrough role, Green appeared in various films like Thunderheart, Maverick, and Die Hard with a Vengeance. If you know your movies, then you would recall that he has shared the screen with big talents like Samuel Jackson and Bruce Willis. His most recent notable roles in productions include Logmire, Disney's Echo, and as Maximus in Sterling Harjo's Reservation Dogs. Even critics have praised Green's performances. While there is always much to say about someone's craft, there has been no denying that Green possesses the ability to bring characters to life and complement co-stars. Take the dynamic between Green and co-star Kevin Costner in Dances with Wolves. It goes without saying that Green continues to be a respected figure in both the entertainment industry and indigenous communities so it really is not surprising that he inspires a new generation of Native American actors and artists. That said, Graham Greene is an actor of Oneida descent. The Oneida are believed to have originated from the Six Nations Reserve in Ontario, Canada. In the early 1600s, the Oneidas inhabited and controlled approximately 6 million acres of territory in what is now central New York State. It may be safe to say that Greene is still very much as active as ever. We mean, he has not relented on the occasional acting endeavors, and there has been no signs that he is slowing down anytime soon. Overall, the life and career of Graham Greene exemplifies the importance of representation and the power of storytelling in shaping perceptions and fostering cultural understandings. If you made it this far, do hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss any updates from us. Now let's take a peek into the life of an actor who has been credited with altering the landscape of one real westerns. Number 3. James Young Deer Not only did he emerge as an early Native American figure in film, James Young Deer also took on roles as an actor, director, writer, and producer. Today, Young Deer is regarded as one of the pioneering Native American filmmakers in Hollywood. His influence is said to have been so great that he shaped the landscape of one real westerns during the silent film era. All of his works notably depicted Native American characters in a positive manner. Born in the Old Southwest District of Washington, D.C., Young Deer was given the birth name James Johnson. He enlisted in the U.S. Navy during the Spanish-American War. However, he soon grew disenchanted with the institution due to its evident biases. In 1909, Young Deer embarked on his acting career in New York. He appeared in numerous one-reel westerns for various film companies such as Calum, Lubin, Vitagraph, and Biograph. At Pathé's West Coast studio, he contributed to around 150 silent films, including Who Laughs Last, The Unwilling Bride, and Cowboy Justice. 
While many of his early works have been lost to history, the Library of Congress recognized White Fawn's devotion as one of Young Deer's surviving films. The film has also been added to the National Film Registry in 2008. While Young Deer's films have been commended for their portrayal of early Western themes devoid of stereotypes like hostile Indian warriors or wagon train attacks, but something else to note is that he came from a lineage marked by ambiguity. While census records label his parents as mulatto, there was still further evidence to suggest that Young Deer was in fact of Native American ancestry. The Nanakoke people are part of the Algonquian Native American community. They originally inhabited lands around Chesapeake Bay and Delaware, and now reside predominantly in the northeastern United States and Canada. There may still be significant populations in Delaware, Ontario, and Oklahoma. The Nanticoke comprise several tribes, including the Nanticoke proper, Choptank, Assateague, Piscataway, and Dogue, all of which remain a rich cultural heritage. The Nanticoke language stood apart from the Algonquian dialect spoken by tribes residing along the western shore of Maryland and the Potomac River. Sadly, Lydia E. Clark just so happened to be the final fluent speaker of the language, and she passed away in 1856. Presently, endeavors to revive this language are underway. This effort is currently driven by tribal members and linguists associated with Georgetown University. Not enough women on the list? We got you. Next is an actress with a pretty interesting origin story for her career in Hollywood. We ain't doing this no more! No more! We're done with it! Number 2. Tantu Cardinal The 73-year-old actress was born Rose Marie Tantu Cardinal on July 20, 1950. She is a Canadian actress with Cree and Midas heritage. Throughout her career, Cardinal has delivered compelling performances in numerous films and television series. Her filmography includes Spirit Bay, Loyalties, Dances with Wolves, Black Robe, Legends of the Fall, Smoke Signals, Hold the Dark, and North of Sixty. Notably, she starred in the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation miniseries By Way of the Stars alongside Gordon Tutsutsis as the Cree Chief and Eric Schweig as Black Thunder. Her induction into the Order of Canada in 2009 recognized her significant contributions to Aboriginal performing arts in Canada, both on screen and stage. They also recognized her pivotal role as a founding member of the Saskatchewan Native Theatre Company. Interestingly, Cardinal has credited her early experiences, particularly walking behind her grandmother, as the first lesson that helped develop her acting skills. Raised in Anzac, Alberta, Cardinal is the youngest of three children born to Julia Cardinal of Cree and Midas descent and a white father. Growing up without electricity, she found solace in the wilderness. This fostered her imagination through play. Her grandmother, who affectionately called her Tantu, imparted Cree language and cultural traditions to Cardinal. She also made sure to impart additional invaluable life lessons about navigating the challenges of being Midas in Canada. The Cree are an indigenous people of North America primarily residing in Canada. They constitute one of the largest First Nations groups in the country. In Canada, over 350,000 individuals identify as Cree or possess Cree ancestry. The majority of Cree people reside north and west of Lake Superior with significant populations in Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and the Northwest Territories. Their reserve lands collectively stand as the country's largest among First Nations. Notably, the Lac La Ronge Band in northern Saskatchewan is the largest Cree band and the second largest First Nations band in Canada. Academics have since recognized the Cree embrace of mixed marriages as the reason for bands of diverse heritage. Multilingualism and multiculturalism are still commonplace among the Cree. She is also of Midas origin as well. This means of mixed ancestry in French, and it is used to refer to individuals of diverse backgrounds, such as Cree combined with French, English, or Scottish heritage. Historical accounts from Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada depict the Midas as descendants of French fur traders and Cree women, or as offspring of English or Scottish traders and Northern Dean women. You are a fool, but at least you are brave. Get off Apache land. But next time, I will kill you. Number 1. Wes Studi Born December 17, 1947, Wesley Studi is a celebrated Native American actor and film producer from the Cherokee Nation. The 76-year-old actor has received widespread acclaim and numerous awards for his portrayals of Native American characters in cinema. Perhaps the most notable of all came in 2019. Studi made history by becoming the first indigenous person from North America to receive an Academy Honorary Award. 
Now, as you are about to see, he did not achieve all of this easily. Born into a Cherokee family in No Fire Hollow, Oklahoma, Studi grew up immersed in his Cherokee heritage. He attended Chillicoco Indian Agricultural School, graduating in 1964 with a vocational major in dry cleaning. At 17, Studi joined the Oklahoma National Guard and received training at Fort Polk, Louisiana. He later volunteered for active duty and served in Vietnam for a year. Following his military service, Studi immersed himself in Native American activism. He then attended Tulsa Community College after returning from Vietnam. There he ventured into acting. Studi has since graced the screens of Academy Award-winning films like Dances with Wolves in the year 1990 and The Last of the Mohicans in 1992. You will also find him in Academy Award-nominated works like 1993's Geronimo, An American Legend, and The New World, which were later released in 2005. One thing that a good actor must possess? Versatility. Studi's versatility is evident in his films. He has portrayed a very distinct and wide range of characters, from Sagat in Street Fighter to appearances in Hostiles, Heat, Mystery Men, Avatar, A Million Ways to Die in the West, and the TV series Penny Dreadful. When you talk about versatility in acting, Studi is your guy. We mean it takes a special kind of actor to be recognized by the New York Times. In December 2020, he was given the 19th podium among the 25 greatest actors of the 21st century, so far. Wes made an appearance on the television program Finding Your Roots, broadcast on January 16, 2024. The episode revealed that Eugene Philpot, listed on his birth certificate as his father, was not his biological father. DNA research identified Jess and Bobby Blair, two brothers, as potential candidates. Additionally, the episode unveiled that his sixth great-grandmother was Nayehi Nancy Ward, a revered figure and political leader of the Cherokee. Like we mentioned, Studi was immersed in his heritage all through his early years. He spoke the language at home until he began elementary school. Now, the Cherokee are indigenous people of Iroquian descent. They were among the largest politically unified tribes during the European colonization of the Americas. By 1650, they numbered around 22,500 individuals and occupied about 40,000 square miles of the Appalachian Mountains. This spans parts of present-day Georgia, eastern Tennessee, and the western regions of modern North and South Carolina. When the Spanish explorers encountered the Cherokee in mid-16th century, they already found the tribe using various stone tools like knives, axes, and chisels. They were civilized people who were skilled in basket weaving, pottery making, and agriculture. They grew crops like corn, beans, and squash, while their meat and clothing were sourced from deer, bear, and elk. Cherokee homes were simple log cabins with bark roofs. They lacked windows, but would feature a single door and a smoke hole in the roof. The traditional Cherokee way of life and culture closely resembled that of neighboring tribes like the Creek. Interestingly, the Cherokee Nation consisted of a confederation of towns symbolized by red for war and white for peace. Chiefs of red towns were subordinate to the Supreme War Chief, while officials of white towns answered to the Supreme Peace Chief. White towns offered refuge for those seeking sanctuary, while red towns were sites for war ceremonies. When receiving the Academy Honorary Award in 2019, he gave a pretty heartfelt acceptance speech at the end. Considering he was the first Native American actor to receive an Oscar specifically for acting, it was all the more wholesome. In his own words, I'd simply like to say it's about time. It's been a wild and wonderful ride, and I'm really proud to be here tonight as the first Indigenous Native American to receive an Academy Award. It's a humbling honor to receive an award for something I love to do. That's it, our list of top 10 Native American actors. Know any other prominent actors that could have made our list? Do share your thoughts in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like button. You also can't miss the next video on your screen.